stand together and start singing.
you for this morning. We see your goodness everywhere. And I pray that we would open our hearts to what you have to tell us today and the rest of the week. In your name, amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome. We are so glad you're here. <laughs> Is everybody awake? <laughs> All right. And there's some people here. <laughs> Claudia's flipping out. We have some special guests here. Um, the last time they were here was at Claudia and Jared's wedding, and they weren't expecting them, so it's a special surprise. Anyway, welcome again. We're so glad you're here. We are a church that the unchurched love to experience, and we hope you find that to be true. Let's say our mission statement together, following Jesus, changing together. Our goal is to be more like Jesus this week than we were last week, right? And so we're in this together. One of the cool things coming up is baptism. We have different ones of you getting baptized. What is baptism, you say? That means, you know what? I'm going to tell the world, or at least everybody here, that I've chosen to live for Christ, that I've accepted Jesus into my life. So we're going to have a baptismal service here on Sunday towards the end of the service, and we hope that you come and encourage those who are being baptized as they grow in their faith in Christ. We also will be having a new members class. We don't have a date yet for that, but let the pastor know if you want to join and um, join the church family, and he wants to kind of see who all is involved and, you know, what works for everybody, so let him know. All righty. As you came in, you probably saw there's a table out there in the foyer. Small groups. Life is better connected. Anyway, I have the t-shirt. Been there, done that, right? Anyway, so small groups, It is. we're going to hear a message about the importance of being in a small group, being connected, and how important that is, okay? So, Sign up, check it out, check out what works with your schedule. There's all different ones. I don't know how many are out there, half a dozen at least. So figure out what works for you between you and God, what's going to work in your life, and you will grow in your relationship with him. All righty. Next Sunday as well, after the baptism, we're going to have a family fun day picnic. We're going to have lots of games, lots of food. There's a sign-up. So what you do is out there in the um, lobby near the cafe, just take one or two of those things off there. You get to keep it. They're just fun little things that have um, baked beans or potato chips or potato salad, whatever you want to bring. And if something's on there, not on there, that you do want to bring, by all means, bring it. And guess what? If you can't bring anything, please still come. There's always plenty of food. So we hope that you will stay after the service and help us celebrate and have a great time. If you're new to our church, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here, and we have a gift for you in the cafe, so pop over there after the service. So all the things that we do in the community, obviously, as a church, it, it takes finances, and so as God leads you to give, we ask that you do that either here in person, we have plates in the back through the church website, the church app, or some people like to mail it in. So that's between you and God. All righty, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. It's a great day to be alive, to be in your service. Father, we thank you that you instituted the church. And we're so glad that we could come together and worship you together, encourage each other in our walk with you, and just have a great time together as a church family. Be with us now, Lord, as we listen to your message. Father, speak to our hearts. Help us draw closer to you. Through your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Allen. We certainly are glad that you're here. 
I got the t-shirt also. Um, life is better connected. That's our topic for today. So I thought we'd start off with the fill in the blank. Life is better when? If I was to ask you, when is your life better? What would make your life better? Uh, vacation, does vacation make your life better? Hopefully it's part of making your life better. Those of you with children in school, is life better when your kids are home all summer or is it better when they're in class all summer, all, all school year? Um, we homeschooled our kids so they were always home, so I don't, I don't know. Is life is better certainly when you have more money than your expenses. Uh, life is better when your relationships are going well. Life is better when your health is good. There's lots of things we could put in there, right? But we're going to talk about life is better when you're connected. <clears throat> now, if I was to say, I know something to make your life better, you'd be interested, right? The question would be, are you willing to do what would make your life better? Um, whether it's uh, finances. If I said, uh, if you do this, this, and this with your finances, uh, your life will be better. You have the choice. Now, lots of life we have no choice. But this is a choice you and I get to make, right? Or something to do with one of your relationships. If I said, if you do this and this in your relationship, would it be better? Again, the question is, are you willing to do it? So, if you're not a Jesus follower, we're delighted you're with us this morning. This principle is true for everyone. Life is better connected. Um, but as a Jesus follower, most of us are, we have the statement on your outline, we, as a group, want to build a community of Jesus followers who are in community and creating community. And if you're not a Jesus follower, maybe you're just trying to figure this out, um, what we do here on Sunday morning for an hour, and we do it twice for one hour, is often what people think of when you think of church. It's kind of a American church bias. What is church? Well, this hour I go and have corporate worship. Well, that's certainly part of church, but church, especially first century church. In the first century church, they didn't think of community as an hour they spend in worship. I mean church. They thought of church as community. In fact, Acts chapter 2 said they met daily. And their schedules were probably, just to survive, were more busy than yours and mine. And they met daily because life is better connected. Life is better in community. Sometimes we say it this way. Circles are better than rows. And this one hour we have corporate worship, we sit in rows, don't we? You all look at me. You don't look at each other. Or who else is up here? Claudia. She's much better looking than I am. But anyway, uh, you look at who's up, up front. Shoulder to shoulder, you... You, you can, what's the word I want? You can fake it, right? So, let me give you some reasons why circles are better than rows. Um, you and I drift. All of us drift. And if it's good for us, we drift from it. Isn't that odd? Well, it's not really odd. We're going to talk about the effect of sin in our lives. Right? So, we don't drift into good health. We don't drift into good finances. We don't drift into good relationships. We don't drift into any of those things, right? In fact, some people say, well, we've drifted apart in a relationship. So healthy relationships require effort, they require work. You have to be willing to go against the natural drift, if you will. I also put that on your outline. Uh, the current of life rarely takes us in the right direction. So, you drift downstream, so it takes effort to go upstream. Um, went canoeing, and I'll talk about canoeing a little bit. Went canoeing one time, they took us upstream and dropped us in, and we, pretty easy. But one time, kids were younger, we went canoeing, and we went downstream, but then we had to get back to where we were staying, we had to go upstream. Much more effort to go upstream. Well, the current of life, the good parts of life, require effort against going upstream. The natural drift is not toward the good things. 
So why upstream? <clears throat> because that seems to be where the good things are. <laughs> the good things require time and effort. We're talking about groups, we're talking about community, we're talking about group life is what I call preventative. There's things called preventative medicine. We all do things preventatively. Probably, I can't speak for everyone, but most of us brush our teeth. Why do we brush our teeth? Because we don't want to get rotten and fall out, right? All right, so I've been doing that for a long time and so forth. That's preventative. And I'm pretty consistent with that. I'm pretty regular with that. But other things, not so much. Proof of this is how many diet and exercise programs have you been on? You've been on one when you were young and you carried it out all your life? Anybody do that? Now, I've been running for a long time, well, until my knee gave out. So, why? Well, again, it's downstream. So, to prevent medical issues, we try and take care of our bodies. To prevent relationship issues, we try and take care of relationship. To prevent financial issues, we try and budget our money, right? Group life is preventative, as we're going to see, about that drift in our lives. It made, made me think when I was talking about this, thinking of talking about this, was a passage in Ecclesiastes. It's just a logical explanation of why group is better. So here it is, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two people are better than off than one. What do you mean? Why are two people better than one? For they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. I don't know if anybody here has ever fallen down and not be able to get up. That must be scary. It must be difficult. If someone's around to help you up, it's so much better, right? Um, I was um, helping, well, somebody is helping me put up uh, kitchen cabinets this week. I couldn't put that kitchen cabinet up myself. I couldn't hold it up and screw it up at the same time. It took two people. So two people are better than one. In fact, why are you and I here on earth. Why did God put us here? Well, it's not about us. <laughs> it's about Him and others, right? We're here to serve God and serve other people. So, to do that, I have to be in relationship with some person to help them. And the truth is, we all fall. We all make mistakes. We all mess up, right? So, we're all in this situation where we need others to help us. Text goes on. <clears throat> He uses a battle illustration, which I've never been in battle, but it makes sense. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. Somebody sneak up from behind you, right? But two can stand back to back and conquer. Nobody can sneak up on us. And then he, what does he say? Three are even better. So now we're a group, right? We're not just a couple. Now we're a group. Three is even better. And he uses the illustration of a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That's what a rope is often made of. So again, you ever been on a rowboat with somebody else? Uh, we used to go crab, and we used to get in a rowboat, and one of us would row for a while from crab trap to crab trap. After a while, you get tired, right? So you switch off. It would be really tiring and hard to do it all by yourself. Same thing with paddling in a canoe. A lot easier when two of you are paddling than just one of you are paddling, isn't it? So we want to look at something... Uh, in the Bible, passage of Scripture, and I think most of us would agree what the Bible tells us or teaches us is good for us, right? That's one reason we're here. That's one reason we read the Bible. That's one reason we study it, right? The principles in there are good for us. <clears throat> and so we're going to be reading from a book called Hebrews. It's in the New Testament. We don't know who the author was. All we know is the contents must have been really important to the early church because they kept copying it. That's the only reason we have it 2,000 years later, right? So, this is in Hebrews, what chapter are we on? Chapter 3, beginning of verse 12. Notice what he says, be careful. Careful for what? Dear brothers and sisters, to make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving. Now, he's talking to believers here. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. So, you're in a relationship with the living God. But things can happen to turn you away, become evil, or even unbelieving. 
Now notice, this is not an ident- you know, we take so much of the Bible individually, right? It's all about me. This is addressed to a group. We'd say our church or a group, brothers and sisters. The other thing that's interesting is <clears throat> it, it, it's plural, it's not singular. Most of you probably know that you can know something is good and not do it, correct? I know certain things aren't good for me to eat, but I might eat them anyway. I may know some things aren't good use of my money, but I might spend it on anyway. I certainly know some things aren't so good for my relationship, especially with my wife, and I might do it anyway. So first you have to have knowledge, and then you have to have the courage to do it. So, consequently, this drift begins within, right? It begins in my life, your life. And Rose don't know. I don't know what happened to you. You don't know what's happened to me this week. You don't know if I've drifted or not, do you? Now, to think back when our kids were young, sometimes driving to church, I was a pastor at the time, uh, we'd fight with the kids or, or I'd fight with my wife, and we'd get to church, and how'd we come in? Smiles on our faces, right? Because nobody knew. Now, I'm, I've got two small groups. I've been in quite a long, long time. And if my wife and I have a fight, you know where I talk about that? In my small group. I'll let them know. I'll say, I, you know, we're struggling. We had this fight about this or this. And hopefully they give, encourage me, give me some wisdom or whatever. Now, one group she's in, and we might even talk about it in that group. My other group she's not in. But the drift, the drift is, is, is here. And I can't tell that you sitting in rows. You can't tell. We all kind of look good on Sunday morning, don't we? We try to. So, what do we need to do? He goes, the, the author goes on, he says, okay, this, I, I need to warn you about something. This is really important. You must warn each other. Now, most of you know I usually look at different translations of Scripture when I was studying. This is one word, this warn each other, that, that's translated like a half a dozen different ways. So if that doesn't really communicate with you, maybe some of these other words will. <clears throat> so you must appeal to each other. You must exhort each other. You must urge strongly each other. Even beg each other, implore or entreat each other. So let me ask you a question. Who has permission to do that for you? to implore, entreat, or to warn you. Do you have people in your life that you give permission to do that? You probably haven't given me permission to do it, but maybe you have. I thought about this (coughs) uh, growing up. Wouldn't it have been great if somebody was there to help you (laughs) avoid the mistakes, avoid the things that you regret. If someone were going to point it out, hey, that, I don't think that's a good idea, and you would listen to them. So, is somebody, do you, have you, you given permission to somebody to do this? This is, this is important. And how often? Well, just whenever a group gets together? No, 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 no. Once you're in a relationship, a relationship is Hopefully 24-7, right? You won't see each other 24-7. The text goes on. (laughs) You must warn each other every day while it's still today. We still have the opportunity. So 24-7, if we see somebody we're in a relationship going drifting, going down the wrong path, we don't wait till Sunday to say something to them. And we see this, we can see this, like Facebook and all these other things nowadays, right? So you see what's going on in people's lives anytime, all the time. So this is a process, ongoing process, right? If I see drift in you or you see drift in me, if I've gotten permission from you, to share that with you. The reality is, we, again, we all fall. So on your outline, everyone needs support now. 
Big reason is to avoid the need for support, life support later. To avoid those difficult situations. Um, got a call from a lady in the community that was having financial issues, big time financial issues. And both her and her husband both worked, had a job. She was a nurse. And she said, can the church help me? I can't pay all those bills. I'll give you a little bit of money, but I'd really like to sit down with you and help you, you know, learn some financial principles, budget your money. Oh, why not? that's too late for that. I'm, I'm not interested in that. It's the old adage, either you can give a person a fish or you can teach them how to fish. The person wasn't interested in that. They needed support, but they, it was too late. They were on life support. <clears throat> anyway, group life should be important, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's more like this group. Are you tired of small groups always getting into your business, trying to get you to share your feelings, discuss your past, confess your sins? Are you just looking for a place to kick it, network, maybe get some free grub? Me too. That's why I created what I believe to be the world's first openly shallow small group. We're not here to deal with messy stuff like feelings and emotions. You got problems? You deal with that. You're an adult. Life ain't easy. So stop the pity party. We all have our issues. We don't really want to do life together. Frankly, at Shallow Small Group, we try not to do much of anything at all. You'll never hear us use the term, unpack that thought. We're sure it's packed away for a really good reason. And you'll never hear us use the term accountability unless you're talking about someone who deals with numbers. Hey, dude, thanks for doing my taxes. You have great accountability. And spiritual growth? Who wants growth? I had a growth removed last week. It wasn't pleasant. There's no pressure here to remember each other's name. What's going on, buddy? Oh, hey, man. How's it going? That's cool, dude. Hey, Chief. Oh, dude. Captain, what's going on? We know you have a name, and that's the important thing. Group discussion? You got tickets to the big game? Sweet. Let's spend some time on that. Oh, you and your wife are struggling financially? There's tension in the relationship? Uh, that's not really the vibe we're going for. We avoid conflict like the plague. Who wants cake? <laughs> Come on and get it! <laughs> and there will never, ever be an awkward silence. That's our guarantee to you. We hate bad theology as much as the next guy, and we know the surest way to prevent bad theology is to avoid theology altogether. And outreach? This is the only outreach you'll ever have to do. Some people say we're superficial, but hey, the word supers and superficial. I mean, who doesn't want to be super? Shallow small group, because when things get too deep, people drown. Won't you join us? All right, tongue in cheek, obviously. Um, our goal is to do life together. The author, back to the author, he tells us why, what's the purpose of doing this? And picking up the text again, uh, you must warn each other every day while it's still today so that, here's the reason, here's the purpose, none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Again, he's talking to Jesus' followers. Um, sin is deceptive. It looks good. We think it's fun. That's why we do it. We think we'll enjoy it. Um, one pastor says it has a kick, but the kick's all, kickback's always worst, right? And you can get to a place where we can harden our hearts, we can become callous, that the sin doesn't bother us anymore. Calluses are kind of interesting. If you keep doing the same work over and over, you get these calluses, which is basically dead skin. So then you don't feel anything there anymore, right? There's no feeling in the callus. And our hearts can get that way. And he said, it's too important to let sin deceive you, it, it possibly even harden your heart. So one way to prevent that is to be in relationship with each other. Notice he describes sin as, as something, not something we do. Some of you will be deceived by this thing called sin that affects us. <clears throat> so, as a Jesus follower, I would suggest jest or, or encourage you or hope, you would say, no, I don't want to be deceived by sin. I don't want my heart to be hardened against God. Well, how do I avoid that? 
Put on your outline. We, group, is the best defense against the seatfulness of sin in you and in me. One way I want to illustrate that is uh, this thing called self-talk. All of us talk to ourselves all the time, right? All these thoughts go through our head and we tell ourselves all kinds of things. Sometimes it's good stuff. You know, God loves me. Um, I enjoy serving him. Um, I can do this, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's, there's lots of good self-talk, but there's a lot of bad self-talk also, um, especially if you're in a relationship, like marriage, whatever. Uh, my wife doesn't love me anymore. If she loved me, she would do this or she wouldn't do that. Um, even worse, I'd be happier if, in that case, you know, I wouldn't marry to her anymore. So, so consequently, we talk to ourselves all the time. How do, you, how, how do you defeat that? How do you conquer that? How do you keep from going down that uh, negative rabbit hole? And it really boils down to fear, right? I'm, I'm afraid I'd, I'm not happy if I stay with my wife. I'm afraid I, of this or afraid of that. So the author saying, hey, you've you got to give access to yourself, to other people. That's the best defense against, in this case, self-talk. So just thought I'd ask you this kind of as a game. What are you telling yourself that if you told someone out loud, they think you were crazy? Because some of the thoughts you have are crazy, aren't they? Most of you know my wife. To think that my wife doesn't love me, isn't that kind of crazy? You can agree. That's crazy, right? So I've done this. I'm sure you've done it too. Don't you wish, I don't know about you, growing up I have siblings, and my siblings had did some dumb things, and I did some dumb things. Don't you wish that somebody had been there for them and said, hey, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> don't do that. Or even me, myself. Somebody said, hey, I don't think it's a good idea. Don't do that. So on your outline, the drift begins in here, right? Self-talk, whatever you want to call it. So let someone in. So some of those thoughts you share with people you trust. There's a tremendous power, that's the best word I can think of, in being able to share our lives with one another. Two are better than one. Three is even better. Think of the regrets you and I could avoid it. If we had somebody in our lives that could point out the fact that we were on a negative path, that we were, dri that we were adrift. Now, I know it's difficult, and most of us, even our spouses sometimes, we don't like it when they point this stuff out, do we? In fact, we get <laughs> defensive, maybe even angry. So we got one more verse, and we'll finish up. For if we are faithful to the end. Now, if you're a Jesus follower, I, I would hope that that's one of your desires, that you will be faithful to the end. When you die and go see, see the Lord Jesus in heaven, he can say to us, well done, good to end. What's the next word? Faithful servant, right? Not perfect, but faithful. So how do we do that? How, how, can, how, how can I be faithful? Trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we share it all. We will share in all that belong to Christ. See, that the drift doesn't happen all, all at once. You're not a faithful follower one day and an atheist the next day. What happens is, and I, I came across an article that said there's a lot of, are called deists today. Um, so a deist believes in God. That's what deism, deist means. But they believe in any God. It could be Allah, Buddha, whoever. So if you ask somebody to believe in God and they say, yeah, you say, oh, that's pretty good, right? No, 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 not necessarily. A couple other things they believe is that if I'm a good person, when I, quote, unquote, good person, when I die, uh, I'll go to be in he he heaven, paradise, whatever their theology. So it's basically a, a works religion, which isn't Christianity. So what happens is maybe you meet one of these deists, and they, they start saying some of this stuff to you, and it starts sounding good to you, and all of a sudden, you'll be starting to believe some of the stuff they're believing. So, I put on your outline, if you don't intend to abandon the whole, if you don't intend to, you know, 
do away with Christianity, uh, leaving, following Jesus. If you don't intend to do that, if you don't intend to abandon the whole thing, pay attention to the little things. Doesn't happen overnight. It's a drift, right? And all of us probably know somebody was on fire for the Lord once upon a time, and now they're gone. They have nothing to do with it. What happened? Again, it was a drift. And they were deceived by sin, right, gradually. It was exemplified during COVID, right? Church attendance is half of what it was before COVID in general. <clears throat> what happened? Hey, I can go to church for 10 weeks and my life didn't fall apart. I guess I don't need to go to church anymore. Drift. So, summarizing, meet regularly so you are not tricked or deceived by sin and drift away from the faith. Okay, we all make bad decisions or we've made bad decisions. How do you avoid that? Let people in. I put it this way on your outline. Someone can see what you can't see. And those of you who are married, your spouse is probably the best person at this. And again, sometimes it's aggravating. <laughs> but sometimes my wife will say to me, um, you didn't have a good tone. It's not necessarily what I say. It's a tone in my voice, okay? And if she didn't point that out to me, I would know. And I, I, I don't want to have a negative tone in my voice. And so most of the time... <laughs> I will thank her for telling me, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. I'll try and do better. Or sometimes, unfortunately, I get defensive just like you do. So again, who has access to you? Who have you given permission to say, hey, I see this in your life. And I think you need to, you, to do differently or change. That's huge. And again, it can get, it's difficult and it can get messy. On your outline, if you don't, if you're not in community now, and it doesn't have to necessarily be in one of our community groups, it can be some other, uh, other group, but some place where this process happens. If you're not in com community group now, you won't have it when you need it. And we already said, all of us fail. All of us are going to fall sometime, somewhere. So consequently, this is really a dangerous place to be, isn't it? When I'm falling, there's no one there to help, help me up. And I know there's lots of pushbacks. Well, uh, maybe the people won't like me in the group, or maybe I won't like them. Or maybe they'll be judgmental of me, and maybe you've been in a group where somebody was judgmental of you. And, and so you have this fear. We talk about fear a lot, right, or worry. <coughs> in John, 1 John chapter 4, again, it talks about perfect love casts out fear. I like to talk about it this way sometimes. Satan doesn't, he loves it when he can do something to cause you and I to choose something good so we miss what's best. And so he said, I don't have time for a small group. I, I got to do this, this, and this. And they're all good things. Oh, yeah, they, they probably are good things. But Satan loves to rob you of the best with letting you have the good stuff. When I think about a group, I, I like this term. Let's call them grace groups, right? But we don't want to be judgmental in these grace groups. We want our, our groups to be places of acceptance with a view toward improvement. Following Jesus, changing or improving together. And again, yeah, I'm doing fine without my group now. Well, hopefully you are. But one day, when you need it, it may not be there. So, finishing up, group life is preventative, just like brushing your teeth. Let me end with this. How many of you have been to a live sporting event? Raise your hand. Almost everybody. Okay. So, your team does something fantastic. They, you know, they uh, score a touchdown or hit a home run and into the game, and uh, the place goes wild, doesn't it? place goes crazy. Everybody jumps up and shouts. Now, we've all watched sporting events at home, right? My wife doesn't like sports, so I watch sports by myself. And my team can do something exciting, and I can jump up and shout, is it the same? Nowhere's near the same. Group life 
is like a sporting event that you attend. It made me think of something I do at weddings. I say, as a couple, your sorrows are halved, right? Because you can share them together. But your joys are doubled. Group life is like that. So, next step is pretty simple. <laughs> Join a group. Or more than one group. <clears throat> the only excuse I would give you is what only excuse God would give you. And that would be, pray about it. If God says, don't be in a group, which you can't imagine, but he might. Don't be in a group. Otherwise, join a group. Let me pray with you. Father God, thank you. <laughs> we thank you that you want what's best for us. You know, it makes our lives better. And a huge part of that is to be in community. To have a group of people that care about us and we can care about them. That can help us up when we fall and we can help them up when they fall. That's church. So God, I pray for each person here. Or each person that hears or listens. To take this seriously. It was a warning. This is that important. And that's part of our quote unquote job as believers is to serve one another. And part of that serving is giving people support and direction and warning when they're off track, when they drift. God, give us wisdom because that's not always easy to do. And give us the courage because sometimes it's hard. We want to pray for anyone who's not in Jesus, Father. We're we're so delighted that you're here or been listening or watching. We pray that today would be the day that you would understand that you, you are separated from God by that sin in your life. We all have it. And the only way to, to bypass it, to get past it, to get in relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. He loved you so much. He wants to be in relationship with you. Send his son Jesus did to die for us. God did. You receive that gift into your life. Confess your sin. You'll be in an eternal living relationship with the living God. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And with that, have a wonderful week. You're dismissed. Oh, okay. <laughs>